There's growing anger over how coronavirus has taken hold in care homes across the UK. I don't think you can think of any bigger disaster that's taken place over the eight, last 18 years than this. We need to be tested. We need to be given PPE. It's important. Our residents deserve this. Our staff deserve this. It's been an absolute shock to, 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 to feel like this. We, we're, just, we're, we're just very, very sad about the whole thing. Over 2,000 people have died in Scotland's care homes from COVID-19 because private companies failed to protect them. The Scottish Socialist Party has been on the streets of Scotland fighting for a publicly owned, publicly funded, free at the point of use, national care service to end profiteering private companies providing inadequate care at extortionate prices to elderly and disabled residents in need. We need a care system that is publicly owned just like the NHS, to ensure that the COVID-19 care home crisis never happens again. To ensure that nobody goes bankrupt to get the care they need. To ensure that care workers get a fair wage and conditions. Only the Scottish Socialist Party has been fighting for a national care service that is publicly owned, publicly funded and free at the point of use, because only we understand that through public ownership can we put people before profit. Can we end poverty wages? Can we prevent unnecessary deaths? Can we provide the highest standard of care to those who need it? Join the Scottish Socialist Party today and help build a national care service. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's forum. Uh, I believe, do we have sound up and running? Is that operational? Is that working? Do we have sound? Perfect. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's online forum hosted by the Lovian branch of the Scottish Socialist Party. My name is Callum Martin. I'll be your chair for this evening's event as we explore the case for a national care service. Now, it's worth a bit of context here. Over the last few years, the need for care sector reform has grown increasingly apparent. And the COVID-19 crisis has readily pushed this to breaking point. Private care homes, failure of resources, inadequate provision of PPE, and a structural failure to protect some of the most vulnerable to this pandemic in our society has been led to a series of circumstances which cannot be allowed to happen again. The proposal on the table then is a national care service. But what would that mean? What could it, would it, and should it look like? Well, that's exactly what we'll be exploring here tonight. How, so how can we move towards a national care service, which is publicly owned like the NHS, to meet the point of need like the NHS, and which gives residents, staff and family both the security and dignity that we all deserve in work and beyond. Here to help do explore that tonight, we've got a fantastic panel of speakers lined up for you. We've got Jane Lethbridge of the University of Greenwich and former director of the Public Services International Research Unit. We've got Tam Watterson, chair of the Unison Scotland Health Committee. We're going to be joined shortly by Madeline Bunting, the former Guardian journalist and best-selling author of the book Labours of Love and also Rasheen McLaren, National Co-Spokesperson of the Scottish Socialist Party. And in addition to the speakers who are with us here tonight, I've also got greetings to pass on from Derek Feely, former Chief Executive of NHS Scotland, and Dr Alison Pollock, a member of the SAGE Advisory Committee, both of whom were unable to attend tonight's forum, but send her best wishes and greetings as we explore this important subject. So just before we begin in earnest, I've got two final announcements and then we'll move to our speakers. First of all, just another reminder to keep sending in your questions. We're broadcasting on both YouTube and Facebook tonight. So if you do have a question, absolutely send them in either in the YouTube comments uh, or on Facebook. We've got our tech people watching both sides uh, and we'll ask our panel tonight to answer some of these questions live for you in the second part of tonight's meeting. Now, any questions we don't have time for tonight, don't worry, keep asking them. And what we'll do is we'll bring together and help contribute answers over the next few days and weeks for any questions we don't have time to address tonight. I should also say you can tweet along tonight using the hashtag National Care Service or by looking up and finding the Scottish Socialist Party on Twitter. And secondly, just before we begin, I'd like to point out that we, we've also been offered testimonies of support from a number of care sector workers so far with more coming in. Uh, as the campaigning continues. 
And just, just to ensure no one gets in trouble for their honesty, we won't at this stage be broadcasting these at tonight's forum. But if you would like to offer anonymous written or spoken testimony to help build the case, do please get in touch with us discreetly. And we will ensure all appropriate measures of discretion are taken to protect all involved, whilst making sure the case is built in the most effective possible manner for reform. Well, in which case, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our first speaker tonight, who is Jane Lethbridge from the University of Greenwich. I'll hand over now, Jane. Good evening. I'm very pleased to be here. I think it's a very important issue that we all need to discuss in much, much more detail. I'd, I'd just like to explain that about uh, 18 months ago, I was asked by the Labour Party um, to develop a model of a national care service. And so one or two of the issues that came up are what's going to inform my talk tonight. And first of all, I think when we're thinking about the existing sort of care system, it's obvious that a market-based solution is a failure. And so really we need to nationalize care services or social care services. And it's often a question, how would we do this? And I'm going to make um, just some suggestions about how I think this could be approached. Um, first of all, obviously, we need to reduce the use of the public, the private sector, because then business models basically detract from improving ways in which care is delivered. Um, and I think the, the public sector, and I, I would also say that I think a national care service has really got to be delivered at local level through by local authorities. So I, and I, there are other arguments for looking at it in a regional sense, but I would go for working with local authorities who already have some experience of delivering social care. But the, the big problem is how to move from having many thousands of small care providers to a national care service. And the suggestion I have is that in a way the, the larger care companies, which are making vast sums of money from taxpayers' money, they could be in a way bought out and it would affect something like 15 or 20% of the services provided. But all the rest are provided by small and medium sized companies really, um, or enterprises. And I think given a suitable offer, if local authorities particularly, they're aware of these small and medium sized enterprises at local level, and they would be tasked essentially with persuading them to move into a new national care service. And so the terms of that um, move would be that the care workers are better paid and trained and supported in a way that they're not now. Um, the not-for-profit sector would be encouraged instead of delivering contracts as they have been drawn into now, they would actually um, be given scope, they would be given grants as they were 20 or 30 years ago to develop new forms of care, to develop innovative approaches to care. And so the, the, the not-for-profit sector would be drawn into this service in a way testing things out, but they would then, these ideas would then be taken over by this national care service, which would be essentially directed by local authorities. Um, I think a second question, which I'm sure will come up as an issue, is how to develop and strengthen the care workforce. We, we know that care workers are very badly paid, that they're often on zero hours contracts, and that if anything is to change, they have to be in a way properly paid, good terms and conditions, and also offered training on a regular basis. But I think a national care service also needs something else. In the same way that the National Health Service has research, it has people in training, um, it has a whole range of sort of research infrastructure 
that provides the evidence for what it should do. And in the same way, a national care service should also have a national research sort of infrastructure so that there is research going on, there's training going on. And so there is evidence about what is good quality care. And I think that would help care become in a way recognized as, as, as having as great a status as healthcare. Um, this will obviously take, take time. Um, I think another issue is that care has to be seen um, not necessarily as direct care, but also as a whole range of activities, educational, cultural, um, or sort of things that would provide um, both care, care, people being cared for, and also carers, um, some support in exploring how you live a good life, basically. Um, and I think there are a whole range of organisations, educational institutions that could be drawn into this national care service. Um, and I think um, perhaps I'd like to almost end on, on the note that actually a, a national care service would have to work with informal carers, as they're called. Um, they would have to be part of the system. But I think an, another issue is how do you in, incorporate a system of governance or accountability into a national care service? And I would suggest that some people re will remember community health services, community health councils, which until 2004, I think, were responsible for almost monitoring local health services, that in the same way, there could be local care committees or councils and that they would be, provide a focus for both the local community, for carers, for people who are being cared for, to actually discuss and plan, evaluate and be actively involved in planning future care services. So I think that there, there is an almost an unanswerable argument, sort of argument for having a publicly funded and publicly run national care service um, in a way managed and operated by local authorities. We have a long way to go before we, we get to that point, but I think we have to be clear that a, a care service has to be publicly owned, publicly managed and publicly planned and evaluated. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. That was Jane Lethbridge from the University of Greenwich and former director of the Public Services International Research Unit. In a moment, we're going to be hearing from Thomas Watterson, who's the chair of the Unison Scotland Health Branch, after which we'll be hearing from an award-winning journalist and best-selling author, Madeline Bunting. And then we'll be hearing from Rasheen McLaren, who is co-spokesperson, uh, national co-spokesperson of the Scottish Socialist Party. So thank you again, Jane. And next up, we'll be hearing from, from Thomas from the Unison Health Branch. Thomas. Thanks very much, Chair, and uh, thanks for that, Jane. Very interesting. I don't suppose there's anyone here who would disagree with a, a publicly funded uh, national care service. Um, but I'd like to just spend a few minutes on the current uh, scandal, which has left hundreds of people dying in, in care homes uh, throughout uh, Scotland. Two in particular are run by HC1. HC1 paid a dividend of £45 million to their shareholders um, last year, yet seem unable to keep their residents uh, or clients um, safe, or indeed their staff safe, for that matter. And what we see is Scottish Care um, spokesman Doral McCaskill regularly on the telly criticising the government, criticising the Care Commission and criticising others. Now, Donald is doing a great job for his organisation, but he is there representing the employers and representing the businesses. 
I've personally spoken to both the Labour Party and the Scottish Nationalist Party saying we can't take everything that Scottish care takes as sacrosanct. Those organisations that Donald McCaskill is representing, look, let's, let's have a look at what they do. They didn't pay their staff sick pay. They didn't allow their staff to self-isolate until Scottish Government public money came in and funded uh, quarantine money, isolation money and sick pay. So staff would then quite rightly go off sick if they had COVID or the symptoms of COVID. The Scottish Government, the public purse would pay. That would obviously leave the care home short of staff. This was supplemented by NHS staff. NHS staff go into care homes, and this, this still happens, and they are paid again by the public purse. So companies like HC1 are actually making a profit whilst their staff, who they don't pay, isolate, quarantine, or are off sick. The public purse already picks up that money. We've had real life discussions with care home staff who tell us some horrendous stories that some care homes, just to prevent reputational damage, don't allow staff or indeed patients, clients, residents to be tested because they're scared that it will get out and it may hit their business in the future if they are known to have had a large outbreak. We know for a fact that residents who have been tested positive in those homes that allow testing are allowed to wander freely. And we wonder why people are dying in the care homes. So there has to be a national care service and we have to have a national care service that's properly funded and the staff are properly trained. And I, and I thought it was really important the point uh, that Jane made about training the staff properly. We within Unison went to Jean Freeman not long after she became the Cabinet Secretary for Health with a programme of free training and education, particularly aimed at care home staff. And all we wanted from the Scottish Government, from the Cabinet Secretary, was her to write a foreword for us. And she wouldn't even do that. That was just a year before the pandemic hit. And we're still in that pandemic. In fact, we're probably nearer a worst case scenario than we are to a best case scenario. And patients, residents and clients in these care homes will continue to die unless we force the government to take over these care homes, to properly fund, uh, well actually they are properly funded, it's just that the, the funds all go into the pockets of you know, the shareholders. But if we are serious as a country about looking after our most vulnerable, then we must have a national care service fully funded by the public purse and no longer, no longer to make money for shareholders. Thanks very much. Thank you, Thomas. That was Thomas Watterson of the uh, Units in Scotland Health Committee. Uh, so thank you all for the folk who are, who are watching at home, who are still sending your questions. Just a reminder, do keep sending in your questions. Uh, we've got a fair few coming in and we'll try and look at those after the, the next two speakers. So next up, our next speaker, we have Madeline Bunting, the journalist and best-selling author of the book Labours of Love. Madeline. Hi, thank you very much, Callum, for inviting me on this. Um, and it's very interesting to listen to Thomas and Jane and it triggers all sorts of um, thoughts in my mind. Uh, just to give you a little bit of, of, of background, the book that I've just published um, is the sort of fruit of about five years research in which I travelled right around the country uh, looking at different forms of care. So I was interested in the whole subject, that it's an enormous subject, covered by this really short word care. Um, and I was intrigued by all sorts of contradictions and ambiguities uh, that seem to dog the political process. Uh, we all know that there's a sort of regular kind of cycle um, long before COVID came of anxiety around certain aspects of care. Uh, and, it, and it's not just uh, adult social care or residential uh, elder care. There's, there's been a recurrent sort of anxiety around different forms of care in the health uh, sector. 
and, and mid Staffordshire the hospital scandal comes to mind. So um, what I tried to do really was just sort of step back from the policy discussion to think, could there be underlying um, sort of systemic cultural issues which have put us in this political predicament now where we seem unable to meet, and when I say now, this was before COVID, we were unable to meet the challenge of arranging care in a way that, uh, that was just, that was fair. There was already deep, deep structural problems in the system and Thomas and Jane have both identified um, several of those, a private uh, residential sector that had got financialized, so huge mountains of debt were balanced on 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 these uh, care homes. I think they were the FT calculated that something like forty thousand pounds worth of debt was linked to each bed in residential care. Uh, such was the degree of financialization in the sector. Uh, what COVID has exposed in a very sort of brutal way is that the system of uh, adult social care and L, um, uh, home care uh, was, was, was deeply precarious uh, and indeed um, the consequences have been utterly tragic. So, so why is it that we have been profoundly incapable as a society of dealing with the challenge? Well it's, it's quite interesting when you write a book because you put forward all sorts of suggestions and ideas and then you get the feedback from all sorts of people that I've been interviewed by in the last few weeks. Some said to me, well, there's always been a crisis around the care of the elderly. Uh, so what's new? You've written crisis, Madeline, you're just using a word that has always been in this sector. And uh, I do allow some, um, uh, you, you know, every time I looked at another dimension of care, I looked at the historical context. And there's some truth to what they say that historically, again and again and again, Britain has failed to provide effectively for uh, older people. And of course that gets a lot worse when you have more elder people living for longer. So we have failed to meet the demographic, the challenge of the demographic shift. Um, and it's quite sobering really to look back at this history. I looked at you know, one conclusion by a sociologist of aging who just concluded that because there is such a lack of respect uh, uh, for, for old age generally in our culture, uh, that throughout the 20th century there have been appalling instances of mistreatment, of underinvestment um, uh, and, and terrible tragedies. So I think there's something to, to, to think about there, about a cultural problem that we have, um, that we don't respect old age, we don't see it of value, that we have been so sucked into certain capitalist understandings of the value of human life as really only having value insofar as it is productive of wealth or, cons or, or, or a consumer. So, you know, you are valuable insofar as you consume, uh, you buy various uh, consumer goods or indeed um, produce wealth. What is our understanding of the value of life when you do neither? You're neither productive uh, and nor are you a major consumer. Um, and I think that actually at that level, we really, you know, that's the level we really need to be kind of pitching some of the, some of this debate. It's, it's asking these really big fundamental questions about our understanding of value. Um, and when I launched my book, um, we had to have it all, of course, on Zoom, which was a little disappointing. But one of my friends, Mariana Mazzucato, who's an economist, um, a terrific, terrific and immensely influential economist, who is in fact advising Nicola Sturgeon uh, amongst many other governments, but she, she, her latest book, The Value of Everything, challenges exactly this question. How do we value uh, something like this? So the, the, the nub of the book that I wrote was really that we have never learned how to value care, that we have not appreciated uh, quite what this activity is that actually is so dominant in our lives. You know, large numbers of us, particularly women, very large numbers of women, will spend a good chunk of their lives doing care in some way or another. Some of it is paid work. And as of course you, you will all know, the, the, all the care professions, all the care jobs are hugely dominated by women, but also in intimate and private unpaid ways, uh, women spend an enormous amount of time caring. But as I make very clear in my book, you know, there is no need for that gendering. Men are very, very good at caring when the situation demands it, as we know from the history of care. On the battlefield, the first nurses were, were fellow soldiers 
um, and uh, the origins of hospital and healthcare comes actually from medieval monasteries. So there's nothing essentialist about uh, the gendering of care. And I think this is one of the great challenges we have ahead of us, which is to, to break down that gendering of care, which I, I, and I went out of my way to find instances of where people through life circumstances were suddenly these men were thrown into situations of having to provide care and found that that actually it was deeply um, important to them and valuable experience and one that they really um, cherished um, as, as deeply affirming of their own humanity. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and therefore that's why the first paragraph of the book says no one can uh, not uh, can afford not to be interested in care because the chances are you're going to find yourself providing it at some point in your life either um, a pretty much full-time task or uh, certainly a very very significant amount of your time so the, the central challenge of my book is that we haven't understood care we haven't been interested in it because it's been women's work so it's been dismissed it's been overlooked it's been indeed invisible, which is exactly the title of a terrific book by the American feminist economist, Nancy Fulbra, The Invisible Heart. Uh, instead of the invisible hand of Adam Smith, we actually need a much greater recognition of the invisible heart, which actually is essential, essential to, to human well-being. One of the books that I found really provocative and, thought, and thoughtful, and I can put into chat some of the, the titles I'm mentioning because I think many of the people here would find them interesting, is a wonderful book by two American economists called The History of the World in Seven Cheap Things. Uh, and it's a great read. And what they do is they, they, they take it through in a great sort of whip through 500 years of history, <laughs> Western history, showing how capitalism really is built on making certain things very cheap and making other things very expensive. And if you think about it, it's absolutely true because the banker gets paid loads and loads of money uh, and, the, and the care worker gets paid very little money. That's a structural imbalance, as we well know, because the value of the care workers work to other human beings' well-being is, is immense. So um, they, they start in Madeira and in uh, this, the, this history of the world and seven cheap things, the way in which the environment was made cheap and they destroyed the environment of Madeira uh, under the Spanish Empire in the 17th century. So it's an environmental issue. And then, of course, care is a cheap thing, in their view. Of the seven things that are cheap, care is one of them. Uh, and I think the, the curious thing is how that, that cheapness, that care has either got to be cheap or free, which is essentially entirely how capitalism and patriarchy were structured, has spilled over into our cultural life. So one of the things that I did was try and find descriptions in literature or art that would that, that would fire the imagination as to understand what could care be? What is care? Uh, and again and again, you see how novelists throughout the 19th and 20th century have sort of tucked it away. That care is too messy. It involves human vulnerability. It, it, it involves our, our messy human bodies. So when I interviewed nurses, they admitted that they didn't tell people outside healthcare many of the details of their work. And certainly care workers would say the same, that there is these aspects of care which are, are all about supporting the dignity of another human being, which end up requiring your own self-effacement. You can't explain what you've been doing at the end of a day of maybe mopping up vomit and shit. And, um, and that is a kind of, you know, inherent dilemma within care, that so many parts of care become hard to articulate or require um, breaking confidence. And therefore, you have to sort of um, uh, uh, respect uh, the, 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 the kind of, you know, the dignity of other people so you can't describe it. So that there are these sort of pockets of sort of silence within care, if you like. It's the, the subject is sort of riddled with, with these, these silences. Uh, one of the other things that again, came up again and again in interviews is how um, care workers would say, and I include in this nurses and, and indeed doctors, GPs who had a very, very clear understanding of care. They would say, all I did was a very little thing. Uh, you know, I didn't do much. And the self, so the self-deprecation, the self-belittling of those moments which can actually be disproportionately significant, uh, the touch on an arm when someone's scared, 
the, the, the attentiveness with which someone actually becomes present in front of somebody else, um, uh, such as a client in a home visit, um, an elder per elderly person who may be very lonely. You know, do you have that moment to be absolutely present with them? Um, so, so I think that um, there, is a, there is an enormously important debate to conclude around this extremely interesting uh, announcement by Nicola Sturgeon of a national care service, how that should be um, run and managed and funded. These are immensely important sort of policy decisions. Um, I think, though, that there is also room alongside that for a debate which actually is much more challenging of everybody individually. Policy experts will come up with all sorts of suggestions. They already have done. We, we to be honest, the, the territory of this public debate is littered with great policy suggestions that don't happen. So I think that there's a much bigger challenge to everybody, which is to think, well, what is the kind of care that you have benefited from? And what is the kind of care that you would like to offer? Because I think ultimately, the gift economy, the idea that you give in order for others to be able to give in turn, and that the gift, as, as anthropologists have described in the past, in gift economies, the gift always keeps moving. Care is not something you can just be a passive recipient of. It's always a dynamic process of, of, of giving, um, and society needs to be structured around that understanding. And the amazing thing, if that sounds slightly obscure, and I'm quoting anthropologists, it was amazing how many care workers absolutely grounded their own care work in that understanding. They were part of a gift economy. They were giving in order that when it came to their turn to need that kind of care, it would be there for them. And it seems to me that that's my inspiration from, from the people that I listen to. Um, this isn't far fetched and fancy kind of anthropology. This is actually really common sense. Thank you, Madeline. And thank you again to Madeline, to Jane, to Thomas, for all of the speakers who have joined us so far for, for some fantastic contributions. Now, uh, that doesn't end there. We've got another speaker. Uh, we've got Rasheen McLaren, who is the national co-spokesperson of the Scottish Socialist Party, after which will be two or three quick announcements, and then we'll be moving to put some of your questions to the panel. Uh, so do keep sending those questions in. There's a fair few coming in so far. Uh, some of them are laughing, so I'll be doing my best to group together some of those recurring themes. Uh, so thank you all the speakers so far and hand over now to Rasheen McLaren. Well thank you very much Callum and I would like to thank all the previous speakers for their contributions and to thank also the Lovians branch of the Scottish Socialist Party for asking us to speak um, and to put on this excellent event. As Callum said my name is Rasheen McLaren and I'm the national co-spokesperson of the Scottish Socialist Party. I'm also one of the thousands of unpaid carers that have been propping up the care sector uh, during this coronavirus pandemic. My mother and I uh, care for my disabled auntie uh, at home. And my own personal experience of this situation, as well as my experience in campaigning on the national care sector for the Scottish Socialist Party, really reminds me that the current state of the care sector is very similar to that which was had prior to the creation of the National Health Service for medicine, where medical help was paid for by those that could afford it, and those that could not afford it went without, with some small areas of provision by charities and churches. That is almost exactly the same model that currently exists today in the care sector. It's pay at the point of use, privately owned and run, with small amounts of provision from charities and from the local authority. Therefore, Chair, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the NHS and how we came to change that situation in the medical sector, because I think it's got some really pertinent lessons for those of us that are advocating the creation of a national care service today. When the National Health Service Bill passed in 1946, it established the principle that it's the responsibility of government of the state to provide comprehensive health care and that that was best delivered by the nationalisation of the hospitals. However, to actually establish a national health service, Nye Bevan had to first negotiate with the British Medical Association. That is the representatives of the doctors and the consultants, the vast majority of whom were actually completely opposed to the creation of an NHS because they feared losing their lucrative private practice patients. To get these consultants on board, 
Bevan had to make concessions, such as allowing consultants to still take private patients. This created a duality in the system, which of course was completely at odds with the original vision. That vision then got further eroded in 1952, when both dental and opticians were taken out of the NHS and prescription charges introduced. That of course led to Bevan's resignation from the Labour government that year, as it so clearly clashed with what was his vision of a health service that was fully comprehensive, covering all aspects of health from cradle to grave. But also counter to that vision was the handling of the care sector. Prior to the 1930s, the vast majority of the elderly or disabled adults were cared for in their own homes. There were only 50,000 elderly patients in what was then called old folks homes in 1948, compared to over 400,000 today. Old folks homes were created in 1948 from what were previously Victorian era workhouses. And these new old folks homes were ran by local authorities. They didn't come under the newly formed NHS. And that was partly a concession to the private sector, just as it happened with dentistry and uh, with the consultant doctors. Um, it also was partly due to the fact that geriatric nursing was in its infancy as a discipline. And just like with consultant doctors in the NHS, this dual system in the private sector still functions today, along with some provision from local authority homes. With changing social norms and a growing elderly population, the demand for uh, adult elderly care has, provision has rocketed since the 1940s, and that demand has been met by the private sector. Today, 80% of Scotland's care homes are privately run. The remaining 20% is made up by 10% provision by churches and charitable organisations, and another 10% by the local authorities. Of those 80% of care homes that are privately run, one in five of them is owned by just five companies, HC1, Four Seasons, Care UK and Barchester. And just as Tam, Jane and Melanie have all outlined, the quality of that care and the treatment of their employees in this monopolised market is absolutely shocking. And nothing has brought that to light more than the coronavirus scandal that we've been living through. Nearly 2,000 residents died in privately run residential care homes this year. And there was a clear correlation between the private ownership of those care homes and high rates of COVID death. 70% of private care homes in Scotland have cases of COVID-19. Whereas when you look at the not-for-profit sector, it's only 40%. Many of those 2,000 residents were moved out of NHS hospitals without having first received two negative coronavirus tests. Now that decision was taken partly to ease bed blocking in hospitals in preparation for an influx of COVID patients. However, there was also a part played by profit. There are two groups of residents in care homes. There are self funders, those that pay their own way, and local authority funders, those that have their fees paid for them by the council. Council funded places are set at a rate of £200 a week, whereas self funders pay on average £900 a week, uh, and a lot of the times more than that. Care homes are paid on a bed occupancy basis. So if a council funded resident is currently in hospital, then the care home will not receive their £200 a week. The decision therefore to move thousands of residents from the NHS and into care homes was a decision that would have been highly lucrative for the care industry. A decision of course that resulted in thousands of elderly, vulnerable and confused patients dying the worst possible death that you can have, on your own, isolated, without even the solace of family visits. It's an absolute outrage. The current private model for care homes is not fit for purpose. <laughs> it's not fit for purpose and yet it still costs the taxpayer an awful lot of money, as Thomas has quite correctly pointed out. As local authorities fund care home residents, £200 a week, 
money which comes out of uh, public finances that could be used to be spent on the NHS. Instead, it seems that we are funding and subsidising private profit through care fees, public grants, benefit spending, personal debt and corporate tax loopholes. The big care providers, HC1, Four Seasons, Care UK and Barchester, are almost all exclusively based in tax havens and they all pay their shareholders large dividends. Care has been seen as a go-to guaranteed investment due to our ageing population. Again, as, as Thomas pointed out, um, in 2019, the Care for Health and Public Interest um, revealed that at least £1.5 billion leaks out of the care service and into tax havens, uh, into private hands every year. Contrast that £1.5 billion in private hands with just the £6 per day that is spent on average for food for residents of care homes. The private care model has created a stratified system where care and care quality is distributed on your basis of wealth and not on need. Those with the greatest needs, but least capital, are facing living and unsuitable levels of care. Marketisation has moved responsibility for arranging provision onto service users, service users who are among the most vulnerable in society and least able to handle the responsibility. Vulnerable private patients get locked into complicated and expensive contracts with private profiteers for residency, personal care and nursing that they often can't afford. And means testing um, for public support punishes people for saving. For these reasons and for all the reasons that have been outlined tonight, the Scottish Socialist Party feels that it's absolutely clear that the private care sector model is not fit for purpose. And we're calling for the creation of a national care service which, like the NHS, is free at the point of need, publicly owned and run, and paid for by general taxation. This proposal, however, is not fully backed by either Labour or the SNP. Nicola Sturgeon has said that she is uh, hugely sympathetic towards the idea when asked about it during First Minister's question times. However, she has um, subsequently put it to review which of course anyone that knows about politics knows that that's normally a stalling technique. And the proposals that the, NA, that the SNP currently have is for the amalgamation of Scotland's health and social care integration boards. And these are the bodies that manage the local authority homes and the local authority funded residents and private care homes. The aim of integrating these boards together is to get some sort of standardisation across the country. But the trade unionists in this meeting will be aware that standardisation is more often than not standardisation to the lowest common denominator. Labour's position is similarly weak. Under Corbyn's Labour, um, the policy uh, put forward in the manifesto was to create a national care service which provided free personal care. That's what we currently already have in Scotland, a set amount of free personal care um, that anyone that needs it can have. You've got to really be careful of your terms in this industry. What personal care means is purely wiping bums, bathing, dressing, feeding. It doesn't go any further than that. And those that need it in Scotland can have 15 minutes to half an hour four to five times a day, depending on your need. It's very little. They also proposed um, paying care staff uh, a 10, uh, 12 pounds an hour living wage, ending zero hour contracts, um, paying carers between visits and um, setting up education, as Jane quite rightly said, um, all of which are um, elements that of course you'd want to see in a national care service. Absolutely excellent. However, um, it doesn't fully cover, it, it, it lies very short of what we would understand as a provision of a national care service that is all encompassing of both nationalising care homes, the carers in the community and bringing them into one free 
publicly owned and run and uh, paid for by general taxation service on a par with the NHS. That's the level of provision that we think is going to be needed. An incredibly expensive and incredibly important policy that will be on the par with the NHS. Um, and that, and anything short of that, won't really cover it. Thank you, Rasheen. That was Rasheen McLaren, National Co-Spokesperson of the Scottish Socialist Party. So thank you to Rasheen, to Jane, to Thomas and to Madeline uh, for all of your remarks so far uh, and for coming along and joining us tonight. And thank you also to everyone at home who's uh, tuned in, been engaging, been sending in your questions. Now, in just a moment, we're going to put some of your questions to the panel. As your questions have been coming in tonight, we've been sharing them uh, amongst the speakers. What I've also done is I've grouped four of the main themes that have come out of it. So I've tried to condense, you know, four of the most common questions, which in a moment I'll put to our speakers uh, and I'll ask them to kind of come in, in in the same sequence that they came in uh, to respond to those four questions or any of your questions that have come up as they see fit. And as we go along, we'll try and get to answer as many of those questions as we can. Uh, at that point, if there's any questions outstanding, we'll answer them you know, in other ways over the next coming days and weeks by video, by social media, by all the modern technology that's available at our fingertips. Uh, so before we move to those questions, uh, I would just like to, to pause uh, to say that, you know, the point has been made that a national care service will not just happen by itself. But it's equally true that forums like this don't just happen by themselves by accident either. Tonight's forum has been hosted by the Lothians branch of the Scottish Socialist Party uh, and made what it is by, by the kind of, you know, time that the all our guest speakers have, have offered to give us tonight as guest speakers. Uh, I think it's worth saying that the campaign for a national care service is a truly broad one. But if you, and if you want to support the campaign and get involved and make a national care service happen in Scotland, to build a national care service which is publicly owned, which is free of the point of delivery, and as the speaker the point, there is no better way to help make that happen than by joining the Scottish Socialist Party. I think it's worth saying that you can join, donate, or even just find out more on our website. I think it's worth saying as well that every penny you donate will go towards forums like this, the leaflets being delivered all across Scotland, and to safe and socially distanced campaigning across the Lovians and across Scotland to help make this happen. And when you join, you're not just joining, you know, an abstract, you're joining the team that helps build these forums and campaigns nationwide, and with your support can play a truly constructive role in helping win a national care service for Scotland. And now just to return to some of the questions you put to it, so that national care service, what would it look like? You know, how will it come about? How will it be funded? These are some of the questions that you've been putting in. So I think there's four main themes that strike me personally as having emerged from, from the questions so far. The first is the relationship between local authorities and the national care service. A number of you uh, on YouTube and on Facebook have asked in different combinations about how the relationship between local authority care and a, a national structure, what's the pros and cons of that relationship? different models available so that's one that's, we might ask our speakers to unpack a little bit if they'd like to speak to that. There's also been a couple of questions about the different parties that are involved. Uh, Rasheen's made the point that uh, only the SSP is so far come out for one which is National Care Service publicly owned and also free of point of delivery uh, out of all the political parties created in Scotland. Uh, but questions have also come in asking that uh, how likely is it that Keir Starmer for example uh, Boris Johnson or Jeremy Hunt of the SNP will deliver or could deliver or would deliver a national care service which is truly publicly owned, publicly run, publicly managed and potentially free of a point of delivery. Uh, there's also been a number of folk have asked about the funding for this, uh, given the kind of profit models that already exist, how do we kind of bring these things together? £60,000 a bed some places are charging, how do we make this publicly owned? But especially in the midst of a COVID crisis, make the funding fit into our existing budgets healthcare, which would be tax arrangements needed, national insurance adjustments. That's a question that's come up a few times from people there. And finally, one which has come up quite often as well is about changing the culture of care. How can structural changes to the care sector prompt a change in the culture of care? Uh, speakers, a number of them have been alluded to this. Uh, I think there's questions about what coming in. If I get this right, I think a lot of the questions here are asking about how the structural changes, uh, both to employment practices and to patterns of care by formation of a national care service, what could those changes do to change the culture around it? What's the correlation between those two? So I'm going to ask our speakers now if they'd like to come back in on some of these questions. Uh, uh, 
perhaps clearer ones that come up in different combinations. Uh, in, in the same order they spoke, uh, just so the folk who have not had a chance to say anything for, for a little while get a chance to say something. Uh, so that'll be Jane, then Thomas, then Madeline, then Rasheen. Uh, I suspect that will probably be all we'll have time for. Uh, but do keep sending those questions in. There'll be a few announcements at the end about what happens next. Uh, and, uh, and, and thank you all for your questions so far. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Jane, first of all, to ask some of those questions. Jane. Uh, thank you very much. I think they are four very good questions and I'm, I've seen some of those themes emerging from, from the chat. I think I'd like to start with local authorities. Um, I'm aware that uh, local authorities have experienced over 10 years of austerity policies and that they're desperately in need of um, sort of reinvention almost. But one of the reasons why I'd argue for a national care service being delivered through local authorities is that I, I think for a new national service, we need something that is linked to a democratic system. I think many people will be aware that the NHS is not a democratically run service. Um, in fact, it's become much less so in the last 20 or 30 years. So if we're going to set up a national care service, we need something that has links to an existing democratic system of which local government is, is one. It needs a lot of support. It needs almost reinventing. But I think if we were developing a national care service, that would have to go hand in hand. And I think if we go to the question about would Keir Starmer and a new Labour government support this, I think there the would be sympathy for that. I think he is likely to support a national care service. Um, I think a, a new Labour government would have to address some of the issues of local government and which are emerging um, I think much more clearly during this COVID crisis. Um, and another reason why I think it's important is that I think services, because care is this issue that in a way isn't valued, that actually if we're going to create a new national care service, we need something that will involve people in the planning, in the delivery, in the evaluation, in the sort of forward thinking about what the care service should be doing. And I think you going through local authorities in a, in a sort of reimagined form would be a way of doing that. And, and I think there are arguments against setting up a sort of standalone national care service are that, that you wouldn't be able to tap into those democratic systems and those democratic systems need development and refining, but at least the, the basis is actually there. Um, and I think it, just to move on really to changing the culture of care, I think I was thinking because it, as we, we, we all agreed it's not valued, but I think if in schools there was more sort of almost teaching or discussion about what care is all about, so, so children and young people were introduced to this idea of, of care um, and it might encourage more young people to go into care and, and see it as a sort of future profession. But it would also, in a way, enable people growing up to be introduced to this concept of care and to make it perhaps much more explicit. Um, and it would also, I think, challenge the sort of very anti-older people attitudes that you find in society, which is one reason why we haven't got a national care service. So I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, uh, for that comment there. Uh, so we've got, again, lots more questions coming in, fantastic ones, which uh, I'm afraid we might not have time to address all these questions tonight, but just to remind you that we will respond to each of these questions over the next coming days and weeks by various other methods. Uh, so next we're going to have Thomas from the Unison Health Branch. Thomas. Thanks again, Chair. Um, I'm going to fundamentally disagree with, with Jane on that, that, that point. I, I believe that the, the National Care Service should be run 
by public funds. Now, whether that's the NHS or local government, uh, it doesn't bother me either one. But the bit about the, the democratic and accountability of the NHS versus the democratic accountability of local government, it's that democratic accountability that's led to the privatisation of the, the care services at the moment. It's that democratic accountability that's led to redundancies. We have a no compulsory redundancy policy within the, the NHS. But as I say, that's probably a debate for, for another time. The important thing is, is to take care out of the hands of people who just want to make profit. Just this morning, we've seen that the VAT has been put back on PPE. So an extra 20% PPE now costs. We know, because we discussed it this morning in the NHS, that means that these care homes, the private care homes, are now going to come back and ask for the PPE to be delivered from the NHS. They get it free, the NHS has to pay for it. We need to change the system, and, and I get that both Labour, um, SNP, the Tories and, and, and the rest of them won't go far enough. Um, because unfortunately too many of them are still in hock with big business and if anyone is putting their, their faith in Keir Stammer, then I, I, I really, really worry for them. So as I say, irrespective of whether it's health or local government, doesn't matter to me. I just want them to be publicly run. Thanks. Thank you, Thomas. That was Thomas from the uh, Unison Health Branch, Scotland. Uh, next, to respond to some of your questions, we've got Madeline. Madeline Bunting. I think we're having a slight sound issue there. Just two moments and we'll... Yeah, sorry, sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, I'm just, I've been responding in some of the threads to some of the excellent questions. So thanks so much for those all coming in. And I just, just as I, you know, we're starting to talk, I see Paolo Caserta is raising some really crucial points. Um, uh, and I, it's something that I, um, you know, was acutely aware of writing the book that a significant proportion of the care uh, workers um, work care workforce both in healthcare and in social care is actually EU citizens um, or um, uh, BME and um, the new proposals for the uh, leaving the EU whereby they simply won't meet the criteria to get visas there's been a sort of dramatic fall off since 2016 in applications that's part of why we have a recruitment crisis across uh, healthcare and social care um, uh, so this is a really, really crucial issue to go to go to the sort of national care service. Uh, you know, this, it's a, it's a funny turn this one because it's been floating around the policy debate for ten years. Gordon Brown uh, mentioned it in two thousand and nine. You know, it's not new, but I don't think anybody has really pinned down what they mean by a national care service. My rough sense is the chances of, of a, a national care service looking anything like the NHS is not high. I don't think there's uh, a political appetite for that in Westminster, and I would be surprised if there was in Scotland. Um, is there some sort of uh, other model that vastly improves social care? Well, I think there's a, a rich array, um, and many of them involve some form of insurance. Um, and it, it's, you know, it's essential that you think about how the funding is going to work. And I see one comment, which is, you know, how do we fund this? Because when I was on Start the Week with Jeremy Hunt, 10 days ago, uh, you know, we were talking about this and he said it's an eye-watering, I think the figure he used was 7 billion, it's an eye-watering figure. Um, and, you know, I challenged him, I said, you know, I think that's what needs to happen. It requires huge investment. And that takes us back to the cultural question, which is that if a whole, cu whole culture has been built on the idea that care is cheap, then they're going to really, really struggle with this paradigm shift to recognising that care is not cheap. It's not cheap. Um, and, you know, the Daily Express were, were interviewing me last week and they just kept on going on and on about how expensive it was. And I said, yes, but there's a paradox because actually the people that work in the sector are really badly paid. Um, and, you know, that's that's the kind of conundrum that we've never valued care properly. Uh, and now it seems like a very difficult sort of uh, hurdle politically for political leaders to persuade people that actually 
care is probably going to become one of the most expensive parts of government expenditure. Um, there's some terrific work by an economist back in the 70s when he, he, he argued that care will become more expensive relatively um, as productivity rises because you can't increase the productivity of care. Um, and efforts to do so, as we've seen, are disastrous. It leads, leads to a really in, inhumane form of care where people are rushing from visit to visit, from patient to patient. Uh, so, you know, I think it's really important we're honest enough to face up to what this, this challenge is about. It's not just about sort of, uh, you know, kind of a bit more money or a bit more kind of nationalization. It's, it's a much more profound cultural shift that's required where we uh, accept and recognize the value of care and that it is really expensive. And as a rich country, we're perfectly capable of investing in what is the most crucial component of human well-being. Fantastic, thank you, Madeline. Hey, and we've got Rasheen now as well to answer some of your questions. Well, Rasheen McLaren. Uh, Madeline, I couldn't agree more with everything you just said there. Um, this debate, you know, has actually already occurred uh, in politics. Um, it's exactly the same debate that happened around the creation of the NHS as to whether or not it should be a standalone uh, national uh, organisation or whether it should be run by local authorities. You had Herbert Morrison who argued that local authorities should control hospitals. Um, and the model that he was running off was that of the um, London County Council, which had been running some of the hospitals in London. Um, but Bevan completely stood against that because he was um, concerned that future Tory governments would simply cut funding to local authority budgets and therefore through the back door, undermine any national health service. And that's exactly the position that I find myself in when we're talking about local, uh, local authority provision of healthcare. Um, that's exactly what I fear would happen, that I see local authorities who have their budgets cut and um, we pretend that there's some semblance of democracy when they're shuffling around tighter and tighter budgets um, and trying to make decisions that are um, against the people, uh, against what they have been voted in to do, but they can't uh, do anything about it because the budgets they've been provided are so small. And that's what we would risk doing um, if we don't uh, go all out and create a national care service that truly is an NHS style, extremely expensive, um, a seven billion, nine billion I've also heard quoted, and that's quite correct. So it should be, so it should be humane and decent provision of adult social care is expensive and it should be and we need to just accept that as a society and I actually think that's how we start changing the culture Madeline that's if, if we make the statement that that's the level of investment we see the elderly and the uh, disabled adults being worth that will shift that will shift attitudes uh, overnight in the same way that the NHS has changed how we see the working class, um, how we see the disabled, how we see the elderly. Um, and it's become an institution of pride in, in British identity. I think a national care service could do the same. Um, and it's not necessarily less democratic to have it um, being run um, uh, as a national body um, the SSP is completely pro workplace democracy, uh, high trade union membership, having proper worker um, integration on boards and workplace democracy, um, which is actually more democratic, unfortunately, than a lot of our local authorities that don't have much scrutiny of um, their services and aren't able to override officers uh, inside local authorities and also the small turnout of local authority elections and the, um, the, the low provision and low standard that the parties give towards uh, councillors, councillors being paid low wages and often having to do two jobs. It's not actually a very democratic model, local, uh, local um, authorities. Uh, so I don't think that a national care service that is NHS style, NHS scale, 
would be any less democratic. And I think anything less than that really risks not taking the bull by the horns. If anything this coronavirus pandemic has shown us is that we need big ideas and big scales to tackle global pandemics and global problems. Thank you, Rasheen. And thank you as well to all, all of our speakers tonight uh, and to everyone who sent questions in. I see more fantastic questions coming in, but I'm afraid that is just about all we've got time for tonight. Uh, so just uh, a few final announcements before we wrap up. Uh, first of all, just as a one final question that I, I will add a, uh, answer a, add a quick answer to myself. Uh, there's a question there, how popular has this issue been? Uh, it seems very popular. Has there been any polling? Uh, well, I can respond to that question there from someone on Facebook, I think it was. Uh, that the, the SSP, the Scottish Socialist Party, has actually been working on commissioning an opinion poll to find out exactly that. Uh, so if you want to help make that happen, you can donate online. If you want to help amplify support for the issue, uh, and help build that campaign for a national care service, particularly one which is free point of delivery and publicly owned, uh, you can also do that by joining the Scottish Socialist Party online or any of our socially distanced campaigning stalls. Uh, now, just to say, there is obviously a Quite a few questions that we haven't had time for. Some really fantastic questions have come in. Uh, so I'm afraid those questions will have to wait, but we will get to them. Uh, amongst other people, Derek Feely, the former chief executive of NHS Scotland, has offered to help answer some of the frequently coming up questions on this topic from today's forum that we don't get time for. And also about the Scottish Government Review, Derek Feely has offered to provide a video helping answer some of those questions. Uh, so we'll hopefully uh, get that and a few other things just and addressing some more of those brilliant questions that we haven't quite had time for tonight. We really only scratch the surface of the issue here. We could go on for, uh, for hours more and still have more to talk about and discuss. Uh, so just a final thought then. Uh, I'd like to, to wrap up by sort of saying uh, thank you to all of our panel. Thank you to, to Rasheen, uh, to Jane, to Madeline, to Thomas. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in tonight, who's engaged in your questions. Uh, and just a final thought. Uh, this has been the Lovian's SSP online forum of the National Care Service. Thank you all for coming. I've been Callum Martin. Thank you and good night. <laughs>